So good morning to all of you. We have so far seen the telescopes and the kind of objects which emit in the optical infrared and ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Today we will look at the telescopes and the kind of celestial sources that emit at the radio and millimeter region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we had looked at the myriad ways in which astronomers look at the universe in the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, cosmic ray particles, neutrinos, antineutrinos, solid constituents and gravitational waves. So as I mentioned, our focus today will be on the millimeter and radio waves part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We've already seen earlier that uh, our window to observe from the earth is open in two regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. One is in the optical region where the atmosphere doesn't block off rays. And uh, we discussed how the sun spectrum also peaks at this part of the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. And now our eyes are also sensitive to the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But besides the optical part, we saw that there was a huge region over here, which is transparent at a low frequency end. The ionosphere cuts it off, but in the radio region of the spectrum is what we're going to look at today. Now the radio region, as we saw, extends from about 10 megahertz or so, uh, 10 megahertz because below this frequency, given the electron density of the ionosphere, the radio emission from objects gets cut off. And these boundaries are not very sharp. Sometimes the submillimeter region uh, gets included in the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Sometimes people tend to classify millimeter and submillimeter as a different part. But we will look at the entire spectrum of it till it goes into the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum, although it is very large, you can see over here that the, the wavelength range is from 30 meters to a millimeter or even less. But even if you take a millimeter to 30 meters, you can see that it's a huge range of about 30,000 to one. This is very large compared to the optical region of the electromagnetic spectrum, where we have from 400 to 800 nanometers of 4,000 to 8,000 angstroms. So roughly it's a ratio of two is to one. But although it's a small ratio, uh, and uh, you can, we have seen the wealth of information that we have gathered in the optical part of the spectrum, and the radio region, although it is large, uh, the windows open to radio astronomers are also in demand by a lot of other agencies. For example, the radio frequencies are allocated for all the mobile phones that you use, the television that you watch, uh, radar communication, communication for civil aviation, for military aircraft. So there is a huge demand for the radio spectrum. And there are meetings which are held periodically to try and allocate uh, frequencies for different uses. This is a United States frequency allocations chart. And you can see that almost everything is filled up for a variety of needs, which you can sort of look up in the web as well. I've just given the source over here. But there are certain frequencies which are exclusively reserved for radio astronomy. For example, there is a very important line at 21 centimeters which is a transition of neutral atomic hydrogen, the spin flip transition, that is as it is called. And that is uh, exclusively reserved for radio astronomy. Uh, this is something where others cannot transmit or, you know, or have equipment transmitting at these frequencies. Now, radio wave, just for a simple sort of mnemonic, I put it, that if you can measure the wavelength with a ruler, it's a radio wave. Submillimeters also get counted over there, but as you can see, these are long wavelengths. Long wavelengths means low frequencies, and low frequencies means low energy. E is equal to H nu, if you recollect. Right? Now, the radio window got opened up uh, due to the pioneering efforts of Carl Jansky. Carl Jansky was a radio engineer who worked at the Bell Labs, and uh, he built an antenna, which is often referred to as J Jansky's merry-go-round from its very design and operating at a low frequency of 20.5 megahertz or so. And he built his antenna to investigate sources of interference 
in communications. They were looking at transatlantic communication over long distances, and you wanted to minimize all sources of interference. So what he found was that there were sources of interference due to distant thunderstorms, nearby thunderstorms. And after accounting for the known sources of interference, he found that there was a steady hiss. And it is to a good fortune that he did not say it's a steady hiss, the low noise, let's forget about it. But he pursued it diligently to try and understand where the source of noise came from. And he soon found out after a long series of observations he was able to point out that the source of emission pointed towards the center of our galaxy. And in 1933, he published a paper entitled Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin. He had reported these results to the radio engineers and the community of astronomers at that point of time were almost entirely optical astronomers, while almost entirely optical astronomers. And uh, so he didn't initially take the world by storm because uh, they didn't quite appreciate the significance of uh, the finding which Karl Jansky made, but uh, it really opened up the new, uh, completely new window uh, to observe the universe. He was followed by uh, a radio engineer again called Grot Reber. And Grot Reber literally built an antenna in his backyard. And he tried to detect the emission which Jansky had detected and which he said was towards the center of our galaxy. Now, um, what uh, Grot Reber initially observed at at higher frequencies, and he was not able to detect the emission. And then he moved to lower frequencies, and then he was able to detect the emission. Now, that actually gave a very important clue because if it was, uh, Black body radiation, uh, thermal radiation, he should have been able to detect it at higher frequencies as well. And if it was even thermal bremsstrahlung, uh, free free emission, where particles are accelerated in the Coulombic potential, uh, then to the slope of the variation with frequency is very small. So clearly he was detecting a new kind of emission, uh, which Jansky had discovered, which we were not familiar with earlier. And by looking at the spectrum, and, and later also his polarization properties. We, we, learn, we have learned that this radiation which Karl Jansky discovered is due to highly relativistic particles which are moving in the magnetic fields of our galaxy. So you'll be familiar with cyclotron radiation where at best mildly relativistic particles or electrons will be traveling, uh, gyrating in the magnetic field of a galaxy. But when these particles have very high energies, highly relativistic energies traveling at almost the speed of light, you get what is called synchrotron radiation. So radiation due to ultra relativistic particles moving in a magnetic field. And what you see over here is that um, when this emission is optically thin, what do I mean by optically thin? Is that the radiation is transparent to us. There's nothing blocking the radiation from reaching us. Uh, so there's no, no processes like dense, very dense gas, which is absorbing the radiation. So it is coming towards us. Then in the optically part, it has a power loss loop. It, it is something which increases at towards lower frequencies, decreases dramatically towards higher frequencies. This is on a log log plot over here, where the frequency has been plotted in gigahertz and the flux density has been plotted in Jansky. So Jansky is the unit of measurement of flux density. Flux density is in units of watts per hertz per meter squared. So the amount of uh, uh, power which you receive in unit bandwidth, in unit, in unit area. Okay, watts per hertz per meter squared. And this has a slope. When you define it as minus alpha over here, alpha gives you the slope of the line when it is plotted on a log log plot. And you can see that this is about 0.5 to 1 in these sources of what we call synchrotron radiation. Radiation due to ultra relativistic particles moving in a magnetic field. And this is related to the distribution of electron energies, which we will have a slightly deeper look into it later. And if it was just thermal free free emission, which is uh, 
electrons being accelerated in a Coulombic potential and, radi and giving out radio emission, then you will get a spectrum which is nearly flat, sloping down very gently with a spectral index of about 0 0.1, okay? We'll not worry about this part of the spectrum over here, which is at the infrared part of the spectrum. And this is a particular galaxy called Messier 82, which uh, is a starburst galaxy. And this emission is due to infrared emission. So as we had discussed earlier, that dust gets heated up by stars which are forming and give rise to radio emission. Right now, we will focus on the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. How does the radio telescope detects signals is what we will see. But before that, I just wanted to point out the two of the telescopes or major telescopes in the country, which was built by Govind Sarup. I was a part of this group uh, till very recently. And the first major telescope which was built was the OT radio telescope. And this is, you can see, is a parabolic cylinder uh, about half a kilometer long located in OT. And it has a slope which is equal to the latitude of the place. And what you see over here is that it is equatorially mounted. All right, we learned about equatorial mounts and altazimut mounts while looking at optical telescopes so that the axis of the telescope is such that it points towards the north uh, celestial north. Celestial north. Now, uh, it's a huge, it's a very long cylinder, but uh, as I said, about half a kilometer long. And because of this mount over here, the way it is mounted, that to follow a source in the sky as, as the Earth rotates, all it needs to do is rotate the antenna in one axis. It can be electro electronically steered in the other direction. And this is the giant meter wave radio telescope on the lower panel. And this you see consists of a number of dishes, 25 uh, kilometers that is spread over. 30 antennas, each one of 45 meters diameter. And what you see over here is that you can hardly see the surface, isn't it? At either with the OT radio telescope or the giant meter wave radio telescope. And that is because these wavelengths are very long. This, the OT radio telescope operates at 325, 27 megahertz. Uh, and, uh, and the wavelength corresponding to it is close to about a meter. So when you have uh, reflectors, which are basically stainless steel wires over here, that if you space them at less than maybe 1 16th or so of the wavelength of uh, the radiation that you're receiving, then they form a very good reflector. Now, you saw in an optical telescope that with the help of lenses, they bring the radiation to a focus. Here, actually, the parabolic reflector reflects the radiation onto the focus. In the case of a cylinder, it's the focal line. And in the case of a dish, there will be a focal point in which, to which the radiation gets focused. Now, what is the basic design of a simple radio telescope? Let's have a look at that. As we mentioned, you need a reflector over here. The reflector reflects the radio waves. And as we saw earlier that uh, uh, that a parabolic reflector will reflect the radiation to a focus, to a focal point. This was also, this is something which we also learned while looking at uh, optical telescopes. Then the signal gets picked up at a focus and this electronics will be designed to operate at a frequency of your interest. And then it, it is termed as radio frequency over which you're observing it and it will observe over a certain bandwidth. And that signal gets amplified uh, because the radio signals are extremely weak. And after amplification, uh, what, what is done is, is usually multiplied by what is called a local oscillator signal. So the radio frequency signal is amplified and then multiplied by a local oscillator signal. And the signal is then at an intermediate frequency. So this, uh, the basic uh, mathematics is very simple over here. What I have shown is when you multiply uh, two waves of sine, two sine waves over here with a frequency of nu LO, which is a local oscillator frequency, and the radio frequency new, denoted by nu RF, you can know, you, you recall the trigonometric relation to sine A, sine B, 
is equal to cos A minus B minus cos A plus B. And then you, you realize that you now get two waves, which is nu LO minus nu RF and nu LO plus nu RF. If I set nu LO to 12 gigahertz and say the radio frequency to which the electronics is all tuned is nine gigahertz, then what I will get is our two frequencies, nu LO minus nu RF at three gigahertz. And I will also get a higher frequency of 12 plus nine, which is 21 gigahertz. But my interest is really is in the three gigahertz band because I want to down convert the frequency of observation to a lower frequency. Why do I want to do that? Because, um, because at a lower frequency, uh, it's easier to amplify, transmit over long distances, filter, digitization, all that becomes a the post processing becomes far simpler. You can also transmit it over long distances with reduced losses. Then you can see that also you can um, multiply your, um, you can change your local oscillator signal to change your uh, the frequency at which you're doing, you're, you're trying to detect the single signal and do the post-processing. But obviously, I mean, you'll be limited by your frequencies of interest which you at which you observe the emission in the first place. So by adjusting the local oscillator signal, you can go and move around in that frequency. And that becomes particularly important because sometimes you'll be interested in a particular line. Uh, say the line of 1420.405 megahertz due to neutral atomic hydrogen, just as an example. And then you want to put a, a tune your, uh, tune your uh, frequency such that you get that frequency uh, in the center of your band or wherever you would like it. So you can see you can have uh, backhand uh, equipment which you, which, you, which you can sort of make it common for a range of frequencies and, and you can keep tuning the local oscillator frequency to try and do that. So IF amplifier and backhand systems can operate over a fixed frequency ranges. Okay, So there are advantages, huge advantages of doing that. And this is just a very schematic rough sketch of what a radio telescope does. And this particular kind of receiver is often referred to as the uh, receiver system, is referred to as a super heterodyne receiver. Now, let's look at uh, resolution and sensitivity of a radio telescope. Angular resolution of a single antenna, again, is given by the Rayleigh criteria about approximately 1.2 multiplied by lambda divided by the size of the dish. In the case of uh, optical telescopes or infrared telescopes, it was uh, mirrors which are reflecting it. And here you have a huge metallic dish, which is reflecting the radiation to the focal point. This is a green bank telescope, and it's a, it has a size of 100 meters telescope. And this is the focal point over here. And, uh, and it is a very modern telescope operating largely at high frequencies. And you can now ask yourself the question also that uh, just as we did in the optical region of the spectrum, how smooth should this be? With the UT radio telescope, you realize that because we were operating at long wavelengths, even strings of wires or a mesh, as in the case of the GMRT dish, was adequate to reflect the rays onto the focus. But when you go to high frequency, centimeter wavelengths and millimeter wavelengths, you will need a solid dish over here. Again, the imperfections would have to be much smaller, ideally less than about one by 15 or less than one by 20 or so of the wavelength of the radiation that you're receiving. Now, just as in the case of the optical case, you have a resolution of 1.2 lambda by D. And what is written over here are the responses of the antenna at two different frequencies. This is at nine gigahertz, and this is at 109 gigahertz or so. And you can see that this is a much coarser resolution over here. This is about 82 arc seconds is what the slide says, and this is about 6.4 arc seconds. So this is slightly worse than the human eye, and this is much better than the human eye, okay? So it's the same dish. So once you go to 
higher frequencies, you go to smaller wavelengths. And because you go to smaller wavelengths, you get higher resolution, okay? And with this design of, the, of putting the focus, focus over here, that uh, you write this particular design, it is minimizing any blockages to the radiation that is coming to the dish, parabolic dish, and getting reflected over here. Now, the thing is that we need resolutions or high resolutions at lower frequencies as well. And, and that we cannot achieve by building huge antennas because you cannot build an antenna of about 25 kilometer size. But what uh, was developed early in the early days in Cambridge and also uh, in Australia was interferometry. So that if you had a whole series of antennas and you combine the signals in such a way that it mimicked as though you were detecting radio emission from an antenna which was given by the furthest separation between the dishes. This is the picture of the very large array. Earlier, I showed you the picture of the giant meter wave radio telescope. And the giant meter wave radio telescope extends about 25 kilometers. And we'll look at that again briefly. But the, the very um, large array, uh, they, they have antennas which are on sitting on pads, but they get periodically shifted uh, to pads which are located at further distances. So they have four different configurations in which the antennas are located, uh, called A, B, C, and D. And D is the most compact configuration. That would be the one, I think, which you are seeing over here. When it goes to the E configuration, that gives you the longest spacings, and it's over 30 kilometers. And that is which gives you the highest angular resolutions. Okay, So if you want to go to the highest angular resolutions, you will not only go for the highest frequencies, that will give you the longest uh, wave, uh, sorry, highest frequency that will give you the shortest wavelengths. And if you go for the uh, configuration where the antennas are located farthest apart, that will give you the largest T. So that lambda by T gets smaller. Now, the antenna beam itself, which gives you an idea of the field of view, that will be given by your lambda by D, which is the D is the size of the antenna, but the resolution would be given by the distance between the furthest antennas. The very large area operates over a whole range of frequencies. And what you see over here is the resolution accordingly varies from about 25 arc seconds or so um, to about 0 0.04 arc second, 40 milli arc second is at the highest uh, end. The giant meter wave radio telescope, which has uh, in recent years been upgraded compared to the earlier version of it, it consists of 30 antennas, each of 45 meters diameter, and spread over about 25 kilometers. Now the frequency range you can see is from about 120 to 250 megahertz, 250 to 500, 550 to 850, 1050 to 1450. It is almost seamless now. Earlier, there were wide uh, gaps, but now with the new electronics, with the new upgraded GMRT, you can see it's almost continuous. Certain regions have been avoided because of uh, strong interfering signals. And the, and the primary beams, which should be given by lambda by the size of each antenna, is given in the first row over here in arc minutes. And at the bottom row, what you have is the resolution in arc seconds. Okay. And you can see the best resolution you can get is about two arc seconds. And that is because the giant meter wave radio telescope is a low frequency radio telescope. So you're operating at long wavelengths. So 1450 megahertz or so is the upper region of the, uh, of the frequencies at which you're operating. Now, this is a frontal view of the dish over here, uh, which was taken by Megan Argo, uh, an astronomer from England. And, uh, and what you can see over here is that the focal points are over here, and there are different receivers to receive radiation at the different frequencies. And these receivers are in a turret at the focus, and the turret can be rotated so that the frequency of interest to the astronomer is facing the dish and picking 
of the radio waves. So these are two of the uh, two of the interferometers, the very large array which whose emphasis is at the higher frequencies, and the giant meter wave radio telescope, which is at the lower frequencies, is something which I have brought you notice. There are a number of other telescopes which are operating at both high and low frequencies. And I'm, I'll leave it to you as an assignment to explore uh, the different kinds of telescopes which operate in the radio region of the spectrum and uh, have made important and significant contributions. Now, to, if you want to get even higher resolution than what has been possible with a very large array, then we come to the concept of a very long baseline array or very long baseline interferometry. Here, the antennas could be located literally thousands of kilometers apart. And the signals are recorded in each of the uh, telescope sites and then brought to a central processing place where these tapes are shipped and then they're correlated and, uh, and images are made or the astronomical information that you require is extracted from it. To give you an idea of the angular resolutions that we are talking about today, I just quoted over here the numbers for a five rupee coin, five rupees coin, and what it would look like at different distances, the angle that it would subtend. Its diameter is roughly about 23 millimeters. And if you put this at a distance of 100 meters, the angle which will be subtended is about 47 arc seconds. Okay, this is about in the ballpark of the resolution of the human eye. Now, 100 meters. If you put it at a thousand kilometers, it'll have an angular resolution of about 4.7 million seconds. Today with modern telescopes, such as the very long baseline array, which is spread across the United States. It also has an uh, antenna in Hawaii over here. Uh, and uh, you'll get resolutions which are of this order in milli arc seconds. And in addition to the very long baseline array, there are also, there's also the European very long baseline interferometry network called the EVN. And there's also the global array where not only the VLBA and the EVN and other telescopes of the world get together and participate to get the highest angular resolutions. Many of you would be familiar with the image of uh, the black hole of M87, which was uh, made the headlines and was splashed across newspapers across the world, uh, which was made by the Event Horizon Telescope. And they had millimeter wave telescopes, so small, uh, small wavelength, and uh, antennas located at uh, the furthest places possible, including one in the South Pole. So that was what made it possible to achieve resolutions of tens of micro arc seconds, to be able to map and get an image of the black hole very beautiful and stunning image, which many of you would have seen. Now let's look at uh, sensitivity. Now first, let's start off with a few basic definitions, and then we'll go to uh, concepts of sensitivity as far as radio antennas are concerned. You'll be familiar with Planck's law, radiating as a black body at a particular temperature T. And this is an expression for the brightness which is in units of watts per meter squared per hertz per steridian. Okay, H is Planck's constant, nu is frequency, C is the velocity of light, and uh, it's given by 2H nu cubed upon C squared, one upon exponential of H nu by kT minus one. Now, um, in the radio region of the spectrum, H nu upon kT is normally much less than one. So you can, you can express this B nu T to H nu Q by C squared, and you can expand this E to the power of H nu by KT in terms of E to the power of X of one plus X plus X squared upon factorial two, et cetera. And uh, then you can simplify and show that the brightness is given by two KT nu squared by C squared. It can also be expressed as two KT by lambda squared. So you remember that the brightness increases for a black body in the radio region of the spectrum as nu squared. So for example, what Carl Jansky discovered, if it was radiating like a black body at that point of time, 
uh, then you, you can see that it would have radiated more strongly at a higher frequency. And that is what Groth Reber tried to detect and, and found that he couldn't detect it, but he could detect it at a lower frequency, showing that it has a steep non-thermal radio spectrum. I should probably stress over here again that the word non-thermal is used because uh, it is not uh, by particles which are in thermal equilibrium, uh, not like a black body and not like uh, particles having a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Okay. Now, this is what is called the brightness of an object. Flux density S nu is the power received per unit area per unit background. That is a unit of Jansky. If you recall, I had mentioned it earlier to you. It's 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz. The unit of brightness is watts per meter squared per hertz per steridian. Okay? And steridian is the solid angle that it, a source would sustain. So the flux density and the brightness of a celestial source is related via the solid angle is subtended. For small solid angles, one can show that S nu is equal to P nu into omega. So that the flux density divided by the solid angle is the brightness. And the brightness is in units of watts per meter squared per hertz per steradian. Okay. So remember the units of flux density and the units of brightness. Okay. And they're related via the solid angle for sources which subtend a small solid angle. Now let's see what happens when a, the sky is observed by a single antenna and also as an interferometer. On the left, what I've shown you is 45 degrees region of the sky, the square region of the sky, imaged at 1.4 gigahertz, which is 1400 megahertz, with a resolution of 12 watts. Okay. So you can see it's pretty poor resolution, right? This is with the NRAO 300 foot telescopes, which was in existence. And, uh, and the noise over here, okay? What do I mean by noise? You can see that when you look at the background fluctuations, okay? Some of them is due to very weak sources, which a telescope will not be able to solve out. But there is a background noise fluctuations in terms of the, in terms of the brightness. So that is why it is written as Millijansky. One Jansky you, we just learned is 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per hertz per meter squared. A Millijansky would be thousand times weaker. And this is given in terms of per beam. Per beam would be the solid angle that the beam subtends. Okay, that is the noise level. Now you can see those peaks standing up over there. They are individual sources. They could be sometimes combinations of sources as well because the beam is large two or more sources can occur within the particular beam, but those are real sources of emission. Now, how do I know what is real and what is unreal? Uh, the, 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 one of the things which radio astronomers would do is of course, try and get rid of all kinds of interference, you know, which may interfere with your observations. Uh, somebody might put on a kettle, electric kettle giving sparks, which will give you radio emission or sometimes a car going by, the spark club would give you radiation. They could be a thunderstorm, which will give you radiation, interference, uh, electrical communication, sort of these wires carrying electrical signals. There may be a loose connection somewhere, which will give you interference. There are all kinds of sources of interference, which you'll try to get rid of. And then when you have this image, if a source strength is many times the noise fluctuations, then you would call it is possibly real. So when do we call it real? If, you're, if it is about five times the noise level, uh, then you would be quite certain that it is, it is real, okay? If it is below that, say, you know, one, two, three, three also would be, you know, reasonably certain. And one or two, you, you know, you'd like to reconfirm and uh, observe it again with better sensitivity to try and see if that source is real. Now, what does sensitivity depend upon? It depends upon, uh, obviously, the area of the telescope. This is the RMS uncertainty, which is written in watts per meter squared per hertz. 
This is just the fluctuations in the flux density, all right? And this is the effective area. This is the bandwidth over which you're observing. And this is the integration time. Over what length of time are you observing? Now, when you observe over a larger bandwidth and over a longer time scale, then you're going to try and bring down the noise level, the background noise level in your image. And, you, and also if your effective area is larger, you're obviously able to collect more photons and your sensitivity would be better. You, what happens is that when you see a noise fluctuation and you keep adding it up, and that is what will also happen when you observe over a large bandwidth over a long period of time, then the noise starts averaging out. Whereas your signal will start, will keep building up. And you want ultimately a high signal to noise ratio. And the system temperature is one which gets all kinds of contributions because your electronics will also contribute to the noise. For example, the feet may not be exactly matched, may pick up some radiation from the ground that will contribute to the noise. There will be the general sky background. So all that will contribute to your thesis. So ultimately you want to get your electronics um, to contribute as, as small as possible to the system temperature. So what you would do is probably have, while amplifying the signal, as we mentioned, you have electronic, electronics, you have electronic amplifiers which amplify the signal, but they can also contribute to the noise. So you have what are called low noise amplifiers, amplifiers so that they contribute least to the system noise, all right? At high frequencies, they also cool the receiver. So these are aspects uh, which we contribute to the sensitivity. And in the, case of a, in the case of an interferometer, which is shown on the right, this has picked up a small region over here of four degrees square. And this has been observed with the very large array, which we saw earlier, again, at the same frequency in a more compact array at 1.4 gigahertz, okay, 1400 megahertz. But with, now it, it has an angular resolution of 45 arc seconds. This was 12 arc minutes. This is 45 arc seconds. Now with a finer resolution, what happens is that you will see finer scales features. And if you want to see more detail, you'll have to go higher in resolution. Here, what is shown is the contours are what this image on the left would be, would be showing you and the, and the Grayscale ones are what is observed with the uh, very large array. And this survey is called the NRAO VLA Sky Survey, NVSS, which has been a very successful survey of the sky done with a very large array in its more compact configuration at a frequency of 1400 megahertz. And what you can see over here, what I pointed out to you earlier, that if you do not have adequate resolution, sources will get merged for example, if you look at this object, with the, with the NVSS high resolution with a very large array, you can see that there are three sources over here, okay? Three different sources, which have all merged together over here. There are indications because the source is, you know, is extended in direction that there may be more sources, but you can see you cannot really resolve them out clearly. With high resolution, you can. And with an interferometer where there are n antennas, you'll have n into n minus one, um, that takes care of the number of pairs of antennas that you can have. And the more number of pairs you have, your noise will come down. So if some of your antennas in the array are not working, then your noise would be higher than if all the antennas are working. And there's a similar dependence on the bandwidth and the integration time. So if you want to make very sensitive observations, then you would go and integrate for a longer time. Your bandwidth will depend upon your astronomical interest as well. And also you would want to avoid uh, parts where the interference, uh, the radio frequency interference signals are there because they are going to uh, muck up your observations if you uh, get them into your band. So those are aspects you've got to bear in mind. So just as in optical astronomy, the size of the antenna matters and the integration time matters. And here we saw that also um, 
the, the bandwidth, the wider the bandwidth uh, you have, the more sensitive you're going to be. But as I mentioned, there would be limitations given both your astronomical interest and also uh, uh, the minimizing the effects of radio frequency interference. So these are the next generation radio telescopes that we are building. Uh, this is the square kilometer array, uh, which is now being built in two different countries and uh, covering two different frequency ranges. Here uh, in, is a square kilometer array, um, which is operates from 350 megahertz to 15.3 gigahertz, although there is an ultimate goal of going to even higher frequencies. And uh, 197 dishes, baseline about 150 kilometers and resolution from a fraction of an arc second to about 40 milli arc seconds or so. And you can see that you're going to be far more, far more sensitive. 4.4 to 1.2 microjanskis in one hour of observations. So this is the square, and this has been, uh, is, construction is going on at, uh, in South Africa. And this is the, the low frequency part of it, which is being built in Western Australia. And this is from 50 to 350 megahertz, thousands of antennas, 512 stations, and resolutions of about 11 to 4 arc seconds, sensitivity 26 to 14 microchansky. So this will completely change and revolutionize our understanding and observations of uh, uh, celestial sources at the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It will be a few years from now, it will be a number of years from now before this gets completed. But the initial results have already begun to come out. Uh, for example, from the square kilometer array in South Africa, as an example, they had initially built a telescope uh, called Meerkat, which is, uh, which is in operation right now, uh, earlier called the Karoo Array Telescope, and then uh, renamed as Meerkat later. And that is all going to be part of the, uh, the mid-frequency range of the square kilometer array. So this is something to really look forward to if uh, any one of you uh, is, are going to pursue a career in astronomy and astrophysics, or even otherwise, just to keep track of uh, the exciting things that these new instruments are going to build as they really knock at the frontiers of trying to detect the most sensitive uh, observations ever made by man at the radio frequencies. And there are a whole lot of issues that uh, these telescopes are going to address right from, um, like from the history of galaxy formation, trying to detect neutral atomic hydrogen at large redshifts, uh, to understand the origin of life, understanding the origin of cosmic magnetism, probing the universe at very early epochs. And I'm sure it's going to throw up a lot more surprises. Uh, each major technical step forward has given us an eye to the mysteries of the universe, which we had not predicted or was not aware of. Okay, so today's class, we will, uh, uh, formal presentation, we will close with that. And I will give you a little bit of time uh, in class to try and do these three assignments over here. One is to estimate if the Rayleigh genes approximation, H new much less than KT, which we, is valid, for the sun at one gigahertz, which as you know, has a temperature of roughly about 5,800 Kelvin. Okay. So all you need to do is plug in the values of H and K and, and, under, and estimate whether this is much less than one and whether the Rayleigh genes approximation is valid or not. Uh, although I have not written it over here, you could also try and find this, whether this is valid or not, for the cosmic microwave background radiation, which we have mentioned a number of times. And there, you know, the peak is at high frequencies and the temperature is low. So we can also try and verify whether H nu upon KT is valid for the cosmic microwave background radiation as well. The second uh, assignment I've given you is consider the sun, again, which has a temperature of 5,800 degrees K and a radius of seven into 10 to the power of centimeters is what I and I want you to estimate the flux density of the sun at a distance of three into 10 to the power of 18 centimeters. 
recall the expressions we discussed earlier about the relationship between flux density and brightness. And I want you to sort of give your opinion on whether it would be possible to detect this our sun easily if it is located at a distance of 3 into 10 to the power of 18 centimeters. And the third one is I just want you to estimate the angular resolution of the very long base time array, say it at, if it has a separation of 8,600 kilometers, what would be the angular resolution in arc seconds when it operates at a frequency of five gigahertz? So I'll give you 10 minutes to go and do these sums, and then we will discuss the answers. Okay, you can check your answers. I will just go through the uh, sums that we did. Uh, <clears throat> you see over here, HD upon KT by plugging in the value, value of H and K and the frequency of one gigahertz, which is 10 to the power of nine hertz and temperature of 5,800 K, I get a value of eight times 10 to the power of minus six. So you can see that it is much less than one. And so it is, the Rayleigh genes approximation is valid. Now the sun, which has a temperature of 5,800 K and a radius of seven to 10 to the power of 10 centimeters. Now what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to apply the Rayleigh genes criterion uh, and express the brightness as BKT, B, the brightness is equal to two KT a uh, new squared by C squared, right? So it will be 2KT by lambda squared. And so it's 2KT new squared by C squared. And if I evaluate this expression by putting on the value of temperature over there, 5,800 Kelvin and plug in the frequency of one gigahertz, which is 10 to the power of nine Hertz and the value of Boltzmann's constant uh, in SI units, then what I would get is 1.78 into 10 to the power of minus 18 watts per meter squared per hertz per series. This is brightness, right? As I kept stressing earlier, now I want to calculate what the flux density would be. So I need to calculate the solid angle it's subtending. And solid angle is nothing but uh, the area that the sun is going to subtend, that the sun will ha has divided by the distance squared. So for example, if you take the whole sphere then the area of the sphere is four pi r squared and you divide by the distance squared, which is r squared, if you're sitting at the center of a sphere. So the entire sky subtends an angle of four pi steradians. <clears throat> but the sun is a relatively small object. So you put in the radius over here and, uh, and that'll give you the area divided by the distance, which I put as three into 10 to the power of 18 centimeters which as we shall see later is, is a parsec. One parsec is 3.0856 into 10 to the power of 18 centimeters, okay? That'll give me 1.71 into 10 to the power of minus 15 straight. So it's a very small number. So if you go back and plug it into our expression for flux density, where you multiply the brightness by the solid angle, okay? That'll give you the flux density. That'll give me three times 10 to the power of minus 33 watts per meter squared per hertz. So you can see one Jansky is 10 to the power of minus six, 10 to, minus, 10 to the power of 26 watts per hertz per meter squared, to the power of minus 26 watts per hertz per meter squared. So you can see that this is almost 10 million times smaller than a Jansky, which I repeat again, is 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per hertz per meter squared. So this is, would be something which would be very difficult to detect. So if a sun was radiating just as a black body, it would be very difficult to detect. And that is true for most stars. It would be very difficult to detect at uh, radio frequencies if they were just radiating like black bodies. But we know that the sun is not just a black body. And we shall see a bit more of that later, that there are active regions on the sun. Um, there is a corona which is also detectable easily at X-ray wavelengths. And the particles which are get accelerated in the solar surface 
There are strong magnetic fields, sunspots, and the sun has its own cycle of activity. And when the sun is very active, uh, compared to even the quiet sun, uh, when there are still various plasma processes, gyrosynchrotron radiation, et cetera, going on, where mildly gyrosynchrotron is where mildly relativistic particles are moving in the magnetic field of the sun, uh, that in the active periods, it could be a million times larger. So radio astronomers who specialize in the sun spend a lot of time understanding the different kinds of bursts, different kinds of ejections called coronal mass ejections from the surface of the sun. But this particular exercise was just to see what the flux density would be if it radiated as a black body at a temperature of 5,800 degrees Kelvin. Okay. And the third sum which I gave you was to estimate the angular resolution. So again, I will just put it as lambda by D. And you can see I said five gigahertz. So I need to convert that to frequency and uh, so frequency uh, to wavelength. So that would be five gigahertz is six centimeters. And to put both in terms of meters, uh, because this is 8,600 kilometers that I put um, six centimeters in meters as 0 0.06 divided by 8,600 into 1,000. So that, that gives me meters upon meters and that'll give me the solid uh, the resolution in radians, which is 6.98 into 10 to the power of minus nine radians. And you can convert that into arc seconds because you well know that pi radians is equal to 180 degrees and you convert degrees into arc seconds and uh, and you convert, then you can use it to convert the radians and you'll, you should get uh, 0.00144 arc second, which is 1.44 milli arc second. So you can see that you can see objects at milli arc second resolutions and with uh, the very long baseline array. So these are the three sums which I asked you to do in class. And uh, if you haven't finished doing it, you can sort of just try and verify that what I have done is correct at your own leisure time. And this is what I have given to you to try and do at your own leisure time, at your own pace, uh, to think over it. What is the essential difference between a radio telescope and an optical telescope besides operating at very different wavelengths? List some of the major radio telescopes besides the ones we have discussed here. Okay, there are even recently, there have been telescopes which have been built operating at low frequencies in the Netherlands, which is going to encompass uh, not just the Netherlands, but a major part of Europe, uh, giving you high angular resolution. Then there is the telescopes in Australia operating at low, low fre frequencies, the MWA. And so you try and make a list of the major telescopes in the world. There, there's also a huge uh, uh, telescope which has been built in China fast. So make, try and make a, a complete list as you can, okay? The third one is, have you he ever heard of a CCD being used in a radio telescope? And I want you to think over, if not, why? Then, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, is the Rayleigh genes approximation valid for the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is radiating at 2.725 degrees Kelvin. So the cosmic microwave background radiation is almost a perfect example of a black body radiation. So you can apply Wien's displacement law, uh, calculate the frequency at which the radiation peaks. Okay. Uh, and once you and once you do that, uh, you can also try and estimate if the um, after you do that, you can go and estimate whether the Rayleigh genes approximation is valid, which is H nu upon kT. Is it much less than one? And the fifth one is just to estimate the energy of a photon of one gigahertz. Okay. That will also have a bearing on the kind of receivers we have at radio frequencies compared to optical frequencies. So these are just uh, uh, exercises for you to mull over and uh, think over as you think about today's lessons. Okay, thank you very much.